So I feel like we've actually had a little bit of a, a period of time where Trump's cabinet has not been embroiled in scandal and controversy, but perhaps they should be right now. We're gonna delve into one of the figures on that cabinet that has escaped some of the scrutiny that has taken down multiple other members of Trump's cabinet. And joining us to do that, Kerry Levine, a senior reporter for Center for Public Integrity. Kerry, welcome back to the show. Thanks very much for having me. Glad to have you here, and I enjoyed your recent reporting on Wilbur Ross and some of his ethical and potentially legal issues. And and I would like I would love to have the audience better understand that. So, one of the big issues apparently has to do with divesting a significant chunk of his assets. Correct? That's right. Uh, Wilbur Ross, when he took office, had agreed to divest assets by certain dates. And over the last couple of years, there it's it's come out repeatedly that there were assets that perhaps he didn't realize he owned that he should have <laughs> disclosed and divested or assets he was supposed to divest by certain dates and divested later than that. And he's attributed those to inadvertent errors, but they're starting to pile up for him. Yeah, and so during the shutdown, he made a couple of comments that seemed very, very disconnected from the reality of regular working people. I love the concept of this guy not knowing that he owns some assets worth potentially millions of dollars. So I guess my question is, when it comes to not divesting, obviously he is in an important position, you know, Commerce Secretary. Right. Do we have reason to believe that some of the actions he has taken as secretary have benefited him financially because of his continued ownership of these assets? Well, I think that's the billion dollar question. Huh. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of things kind of coming into play here. One is that he's a cabinet level official, he's he's involved at very high levels in trade and tariff negotiations and other things. And so it starts getting into these very technical questions about, well, what is a particular matter that could have a direct and predictable effect on his financial interests? Has he participated in anything like this? If ethics officials had realized he still owns some of these assets, would they have told him to recuse from things that he didn't recuse from? And these are things that are still getting unwound. And senators from both political parties have asked the Commerce Department's Inspector General, who's the chief watchdog for the department, to look into that very question. And and I think we're all waiting for that. So in your investigation of Wilbur Ross, outside of the the assets that he should have divested, what what other concerns did, did you unearth? Well, I think what we found is that uh, it's just very rare and very unusual for a cabinet level official to have ethics officials refuse to certify their financial disclosures. Essentially, this is something that is a really rare rebuke of a cabinet level official. It happens when they think the disclosures aren't accurate, when there's an investigation ongoing. Uh, and so that's the situation we find ourselves in with Wilbur Ross. Ethics officials have finally said, look, we just can't say that we think these reports are right. We can't say that they're complete. And we do not think that you're complying with the ethics agreement that you made when you took office. And and so that is just a very unusual situation that we find ourselves in with, with Secretary Ross. So putting the, the Commerce Secretary in the context of the rest of the cabinet and the White House, obviously there are, there are concerns about a number of them. From the point of view of the Center for Public Integrity, based on the research that you've done during the, the Trump administration, how would you how would you compare their commitment to traditional ethical norms <laughs> in these areas where theoretically they could be personally financially benefiting from decisions in comparison to past administrations? That's been a really striking thing that we found while reporting on this. And I'll tell you why. I have so rarely had ethics watchdogs say to us, you know, this case of Secretary Ross really says a lot to us about the administration's commitment to ethics and to ethics rules and to ethics norms. Because what what we found is that the system has long relied on public pressure and political pressure for enforcement. You know, besides a public scolding, there's really very little ethics officials can do right now about Wilbur Ross and and whether or not he's complying with this ethics agreement. They can ask him to do it, they can tell him he should do it, they can tell him he's eroding public trust if he does not do it. But there's really very few tools in the toolkit. And so what a lot of people said to us while we were reporting the story, which I reported together with Peter Overby of NPR, was look, you know, In any other White House, someone would have picked up the phone and called and said, straighten this out, this can't happen again. And we really don't feel like that's happening here. 
And so the other thing people said is that Secretary Ross is an, an enormously wealthy man with complicated financial holdings, much like the president of the United States. And the difference here, though, is that there are laws that apply to everyone but the president of the United States that Secretary Ross has to comply with. And, and those that's where the questions are. People are looking into whether he's done that. So that, that is extremely interesting. Um, and if policy is being set, if, if you know, if either laws are being pushed or behind the scenes regulations are being established in a way that is being biased by his own personal financial stake, that's obviously incredibly significant. What I'm curious is though, we've had multiple members of his cabinet resign you know, in a cloud of a number of different scandals, significant yes. all the way down to the silly. Um, what do you think explains why Wilbur Ross has not received the same level of scrutiny? I think that his uh, disclosure issues are really a little wonky. You know, they're for people like me who like <laughs> sitting there combing through dozens of pages of disclosures of, of you know, companies named like Alphabet Soup, right? Your mm -hmm. average person is is much going to be much more interested in a scandal over whether someone used a private jet on the government dime, and so. I think that these just don't get as much attention because people think that they're kind of technical and boring. But it's interesting because ethics watchdogs are absolutely raising the alarm say, and saying the Wilbur Ross case really should get more attention. And the reason is because these issues go to the heart of why we have ethics rules for government officials. We have these rules so that the public knows that public officials are acting in their interest, not, not in in the public's interest, not in their own interest. And so if Wilbur Ross, in fact, didn't disclose everything he was supposed to disclose, if ethics officials weren't able to monitor him for conflicts, that goes to public trust in government, and that's important. Well, and hopefully as a result of your investigation and reporting, there will be some renewed scrutiny on Secretary Ross. Thanks. Carrie Levine of the Center for Public Integrity, thank you so much for joining us once again. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much for watching this clip from The Damage Report. If you liked it, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and ring the bell on YouTube to get notifications of our new videos. And of course, you can catch the full Damage Report live every weekday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific on TYT Network on YouTube TV.